Good evening. Welcome to the Hopkinton School Committee's regular meeting for Thursday, March 26, 2020. Tonight, we are convening via Zoom, where all participants are joining remotely through a video conference platform, Zoom. We are convening in this manner due to the COVID-19 pandemic and the resulting suspension order of certain open meeting laws by Massachusetts Governor Charlie Baker. Details of this order are attached in your packet. I would now like to call the meeting to order and request all those present to please rise in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Next up on the agenda, uh, and please uh, allow me a little bit to toggle. Is recognitions. Um, I have a recognition that I want to call out tonight. Um, this is, of course, because of the pandemic that we're facing, and without exception, across our town, our state, our country, and our world, we're facing COVID-19 and the debilitating impact it has had on our way of life. This pandemic has brought loss, isolation, anxiety, and disappointments. And yet, it has brought out some remarkable human qualities to the fore. Tonight, I'd like to recognize these qualities, which I have experienced, seen, and heard of in our community. I'm filled with hope and confidence that we will overcome this challenge that we are facing. And these qualities are wisdom, compassion, tenacity, ingenuity, generosity, and solidarity. In our Ghana's words, this will be a marathon. And in a community where we know a thing or two about marathons and with these human traits, I am certain we shall prevail. At this point, I'd like to check if anyone else has any other recognitions that they would like to call out. Okay, having said that, we enter into the public comment section. Nancy, if there are any public comments that you would like to read out, please. Yes, thank you. So we did receive a couple of public comments by email. The first public comment is from Sean Carney and he says, at what point exactly are we as a community going to require the school staff to be producing a learning experience equal to a full day as they continue to be compensated as such? I do not want to hear about maintaining a level playing field. Those who want to continue learning will. Those who do not value the time will not. The resources are there for those looking. If this thought process is not shared, then second question is what part of the tax revenue will be returned to the households to compensate for the loss? as we are bearing the burden at this point. So that was one public comment. And I know that um, while we're not able to discuss the comments as a committee, I know that Dr. Kavanaugh is addressing some of these questions in her report. The next comment is from Ann Beauchamp, who said, I'd like to thank Hopkinton teachers, staff, and administrators for working so hard to navigate through this new challenging time. I'd particularly like to thank the district for keeping student teacher school connections at the forefront. And then I have another one from Candace Borg. And the, the question is, when will there be a consistent mandatory remote learning plan in place for all students, including elementary? Currently, this seems to vary considerably by teacher. Parents need more support as many of us are trying to juggle new homeschool responsibilities while also working from home. We need structured lesson plans and ideally some video lessons from teachers. So those are the, I don't know if anybody received any others. Those are the, the ones that I have received. No, I think the only other comments that uh, have come in are relevant to our discussion about the transportation policy. So we can hold them till then. Right. right. And I think those are more general correspondence rather than being called out as public comment. Right, Dr. Kavanaugh? The transportation ones? That's right. Yes. Okay. Um, if there are um, 
no other texts received, right, Nancy? Yes, I, and we do have another public comment period, I believe, at the end, at the end. and I mean, I will read those at the end as well. Okay, great, sounds great. Um, the text is right into reports. Dr. Kavanaugh, your report, please. Okay. So I'm hoping this is appearing on people's screens at home. Um, I chose my front picture because I, there's a particular emptiness about those swings that you're seeing there. And um, that's really the way I think that all of our administrators and our teachers and central office administrators are feeling right now. Um, it's when you are in or around or near the Hopkinton Public Schools, it feels very lonely because they are usually buildings that are very alive with our kids. And so um, I am hoping that the kids are missing us as much as we are missing them. And, and I do think that right now, that whole human connection um, that, that we are so accustomed to is, has us in a place where we're feeling a lot of loss. Um, so how is the coronavirus really impacting our public schools? Uh, our new return to school date is Monday, May 4th. And when I started creating this presentation for tonight, that was not true. And I had learned yesterday morning through the superintendent's group that our governor would be uh, announcing that tomorrow, yesterday afternoon. Uh, what we have learned about Governor Baker is that he is approaching this in an incremental kind of way. And so while we are hopeful that we could be back in school on May 4th, um, there is no guarantee that we'll be back in school on, on May 4th. Um, so, as a district, we are starting now to plan the presentation of moving forward with the curriculum, and I will certainly explain that on a, on a future slide, um, but we will also start recording assessments for our students. Uh, all of our school buildings and our fields are currently closed, and I know that's very disappointing to people, but in the face of this pandemic, it seems the socially responsible thing for the schools to do. Um, if there is any family who needs any help at all with acquiring food, that family should reach out to any trusted individual in the Hopkinton Public Schools. So if you are particularly close to your math teacher, for example, or your guidance counselor, and you wanna communicate with that person, that person can connect you to Michelle Babin, who is our Director of Food Services. Uh, we are very fortunate that she is working closely with Hopkinton Youth and Family Services, as well as uh, with Project Just Because. And so uh, food is available for not just free and reduced lunch, but also for anyone who really needs a, a meal, uh, three meals a day. So please reach out to Michelle Babin and she can help you to make those connections. Um, stay in touch with your teachers and your fellow students. We've been doing a lot of sort of that virtual and, and online kind of learning, a lot of Zoom classrooms, a lot of Google classrooms, and there's only a certain percentage of kids who are sort of showing up. And I think in the beginning, a lot of our goal was just to really kind of keep people connected to one another. So I'm hoping in phase two, when we begin launching new curricula, we'll see a whole lot more of our kiddos there. And if there are any other questions that people have about the impact of the coronavirus just on the community, please see the town website. We've been working very closely with our town partners and they have a, a website that we all contribute to and update every day. All right, so uh, why has it taken us so long to get to where we have needed to go? I'm just gonna open this. Uh, so we are going to be launching new curriculum. Hopefully our new launch date is going to be Monday, April 6th, and that's going to be sort of based on re re readiness within um, the school department. So people are, you know, wondering why didn't we do this two weeks ago? Two weeks ago, we were given guidance by the Massachusetts Department of Elementary and Secondary Education that we should not begin new instruction. And the message that we kept getting from them was around equity. They would say that not every student had access to technology, not every student who would normally get some kind of support services, whether that is OTs, PT, speech, English language learning, special education services, they wouldn't have access to those tools. Uh, it would not be appropriate to have some kids who had a lot of parental help at home and have other students who didn't. And so the commissioner seemed adamantly against moving ahead with new curriculum and Hopkinton following his guidelines said, okay, what we will do is pretty much review other material that we had 
you know, already been presenting to our kids, give them an opportunity for enrichment, other learning experiences, engagement, but mostly and most importantly, we thought connection to one another and connection to their teachers in the school community. Um, so when we do start to uh, present this, and, and I'm sorry that you can't actually see that so well on your screen, maybe there's something I can do to slide that over. I, my understanding is that I'm getting a message here that it's HCAM is just there, all they can see is a black screen right now. Oh, okay. Yeah, so I was just, I actually just uh, tried to pull it up because I did get that message as well. And um, we aren't listed on the HCAM live streams at this time. So maybe it's being recorded and not live streamed. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Yep, I don't, it's not there. Okay. Sorry to interrupt you, Carol. No, that's, okay. nope, that's all right. It's important that people are able to access this. Hey, hey. No. Yeah, I was pretty certain that Jim Cousins was going to be recording this from behind the scenes. So not broadcasting. Sorry, I've been talking with the mute button on. Um, I know that Georgette is listening to this, so maybe she's able to make some connection with Jim behind the scenes. I just emailed him as well. Poor okay, guy. Great. Thank you, Jen. Sure. Why don't we uh, keep moving along, Dr. Kavanaugh, and okay. um, then come back if need be? Sure. Uh, so I will move on to the second why is this taking so long? Um, I guess in terms of length, no matter what it is that we implement starting on April 6th, it will never be the same sort of quality that children are getting if they are sitting in our classrooms with for six and a half hours a day with a teacher in front of them, uh, working with other children. Uh, there's just not that same level of quality of education. Um, that said, it will be our goal to see how far we can get in the curriculum between now and June 23rd. Um, it, it's a little disappointing that we that we may not get back to school this year, but we are going to try to have the highest quality remote education that we possibly can. Um, the Massachusetts Department of Elementary and Secondary Education uh, recommends that we ask students to engage in learning um, that should take about half of the day. So. Um, Kids will have particular times of the day when they can, at the secondary level, where they will be interacting with their English teacher, their math teacher, their science teacher. And, you know, so for example, the English teacher may interact with you on Monday, but not have a reason to on Tuesday. And in the meantime, there is work that you would be doing sort of independently until you catch back up with that teacher again, which could happen on Wednesday. Uh, but given the fact that our kids have seven classes a day and if we were piping in a teacher for seven hours a day that would sort of eliminate all of that time that because typically in a classroom the teacher isn't teaching the entire time what's happening is kids are interacting they're working on things independently now what will happen is kids will have to work on small groups that they in small groups that they may arrange in their own household so there will certainly be a whole lot of learning going on but it's not going to be in that same time frame some of it will be synchronous 
meaning that the teacher and the student will agree to meet up at a particular time of day. And sometimes that will be all 24 kids in the classroom. Sometimes that could be 75 kids across three sections of the same course. Sometimes that might be five students who are struggling with a particular concept. But a lot of this will be synchronous, but a lot of it will be asynchronous as well. So if a student you know, gets up in the morning and doesn't have an English class until 10 o'clock, but maybe has a math class at nine and then nothing else till two. That could be happening, um, but there's time in between where kids are going to have to be very wise about budgeting the kind of work that they need to do to kind of keep pace with what's going on in a remote classroom. Um, that's one of the, I guess that's the nature of um, remote education is that it can be synchronous, but it can be asynchronous and kids are going to have to learn how to kind of manipulate that at, and at the elementary levels, parents are going to have to. Our teachers will be very clear about meeting times and expectations. Um, so I don't want anyone to feel as if they're going to be left kind of hanging out there. They certainly will not be. Um, one of the major concerns, number four, is that our most vulnerable learners, kids who have additional needs, are at risk. And I think I mentioned that a few minutes ago that that was originally the Commissioner of, of, of Education's reservations about moving to introducing new curriculum. Uh, we, over the weekend, um, Betsy DeVos, who is the um, Education Director at the federal level, uh, issued um, an advisory that it is now time for school districts to begin to um, support our kids with special education services. The mantra at this point is some services, whatever they look like delivered remotely, are better than no services. And so just today, Russell Johnston, who is the head of special education at the state level, met with all of the state special, the special education directors around the state and some superintendents. And so we now have a much better idea of what that's going to look like. Are we going to struggle a little bit in you know, figuring out what it looks like when we have to deliver L services or OT or speech or special education? Absolutely. And is there a whole lot of uh, work that we have to do with families before we begin the implementation? Yes, of course. Um, but the one thing that Russell Johnston said repeatedly this morning is stay in touch with your families and families stay in touch with your special educators. And I think that that will help us to get through the, this period. Same thing for L teachers and L families. Please be in correspondence all the time because this will help our most vulnerable learners make progress during this time. Um, as late as tomorrow morning, superintendents will again have another meeting with the Commissioner of Education. I know this seems kind of crazy, but we continue to get updates all the time. Um, you may have heard Governor Baker say, you know, this will allow us, yesterday, in yesterday's talk uh, across the state, he did say that this is going to afford us the opportunity to provide kids with some very good education remotely. And originally that was not the messaging that came from the state, now that is the messaging that's coming from the state. And so that's the, the track that we will proceed on. Um, and number seven, are we ever going to get to cover all that we would have before June 23rd? Absolutely not. And so one of the reasons that this is taking so long is that we have our curricular leaders, CTLs, SMLs, at this point taking a look at what are those power standards? What are the things that we think our kids need before they can advance from one grade to the next? So for example, without which you wouldn't want a second grader to progress into third grade or without which you wouldn't want a student to go from algebra one to more advanced mathematics. All right, so what has been happening with our curriculum? Um, in the beginning, what we were doing is we were sort of researching and vetting resources for remote learning. There are other districts across the state of Massachusetts that had been approved to do alternative structured learning days, ASLDs, and people know that better as blizzard bags. Hopkinton was not one of those communities. And so we, uh, we, we were sort of on, on hold. With the, the commissioner had said, if you weren't approved to do that, and this is really the last year that they're offering that, then you weren't gonna sort of get credit for the days that you were doing that kind of instruction. And so we were in a holding pattern for a little bit there. But behind the scenes, we were connecting with our technology department. And I do want to have a shout out here to our tech director, Mr. Ghosh, and his entire department. They have been working tirelessly to get all kinds of resources and um, all kinds of uh, 
tech platforms up and running that are developmentally appropriate. So at the elementary level, for example, our teachers are all across the boards kind of like messing around right now with Seesaw to see if that's the way they want to push out information or Zoom. And at the high school and middle school levels, there are other things that we're thinking about using that would be more appropriate for kids at those grade levels. We are creating opportunities for collaboration between the administrators, uh, the curriculum director, directors, classroom teachers, and now we are um, thinking about moving in the direction of special education now that we have uh, guidance from, from the department. And we are making sure that there are connections between our educators and students and families. That right there has been the most important criterion to all of us. In terms of moving forward, so we will now start remote learning opportunities that are going to include new instruction. And there will also be review, enrichment, some form of assessment and feedback. We will be recording those assessments so that you know parents will be able to see the kinds of progress that their kids are making. Uh, we will be securing ways in which educators and related service providers are going to be delivering remote instruction. We will review the curriculum to highlight those critical skills and that important content that kids are going to need to go from one grade level to another. We will be ensuring connections between educators and families, and we will be refining that process as we go. We're all sort of fumbling in the dark here because this is the first time that public K-12 education um, has gone fully online, those typical face-to-face um, -face in a classroom kinds of education. This is going to be a huge change for our educators. All right, so what are some of those remote learning um, opportunities? We have Google Hangouts, Epic, Myon, Scholastic Online, Freckle, Mind Yeti, Lunch Doodles with Mo Willems, uh, Google Classroom, by phone, by TV, Brain Pop, Zoom, and Canvas. So all of those things are things that we are uh, kind of messing around with now and finding out which would be the best way to deliver different types of content, different types of skills, and at what grade level. All right, so that's uh, where we are with curriculum and instruction. I know that there are families who are very eager to move on to the next phase. Um, if there is any hesitation at all, um, on our part, it really has only been to make sure that we are de delivering to children uh, the very best online education that we can. So our remote learning experience will start fully on the 6th of April. All of next week, however, all of the enrichment uh, and engagement opportunities will still be there and we're encouraging kids to stay connected. Um, so moving on, um, COVID-19 and budget questions. And let me tell you that this is really at a 30,000 foot level because people continue to ask us, oh, what are we saving in FY20? I can tell you, and the best way to describe it for me is like a Polaroid picture. Right now it's entirely fuzzy. We don't, we hardly see anything in the picture. And little by little things will become clearer over time. So I am trying to avoid there being any misconceptions in our community because I'm guessing that people are thinking, well, this is great. While there is no school in session right now, my goodness, we must be having a, a ton of savings. And I cannot say whether that is correct or whether that is not correct. So let me give you a good example. There may be people who are thinking, oops, that as long as the school buses aren't running, um, it's great that we're not having to pay our school bus contract. Um, that is not a correct thing for us to believe. We have actually sent our contract, our school bus contract, for example, out to our legal counsel to review because there are questions about what kinds of things are we required to pay and what kinds of things are we not required to pay. So for example, if Conley bought 77 student buses for us, for Hopkinton, and they are currently making bus payments on those, those vehicles, there is a legal obligation to continue our contract to pay for the um, to pay for those buses, um, but we're not incurring fuel costs. So, is there a legal obligation to pay for fuel that we're not using? Probably not. But right now, the way our bus contract is worded is we have a 540-day contract over three years, um, and so we are really looking at what does this mean, and we are hoping to enter into negotiations with Conley. So. I use this to illustrate just how complex the situation is with all of the various contracts that we have across hundreds of vendors, really. 
Now that said, there really are places where we can say, you know, absolutely, there are places that we can be sure that we are saving money. How much money that is, we really do not know. So let me give you an example. In utilities, right now we have all of our buildings in shutdown mode. What the savings is on that, we really don't know because we've never put our buildings in shutdown mode for 50 days and, and tried to see, well, how much money are we gonna save without paying for water or without paying for electricity or without paying for heat or air conditioning or what, whatever we would have been using during that time. Um, at some point in the future, we will have those numbers for people in the community who may be interested in that kind of saving. Substitute teachers. Currently, we're not paying day-to-day -day subs. And so typically, you know, if we had a second grade teacher who fell ill and wasn't coming to school for a day or two, we would put a substitute teacher in that classroom. So that's a savings for us right now. That said, if we have one of our teachers who will be putting out curriculum over time right now, um, and that person becomes ill for a number of days, we will have to pay a long-term sub to take on the role of that teacher who would be putting out curriculum to students daily from now until either May 4th or if the closure is extended. Um, and we have to imagine that we might have people who leave us long-term because they you know, may need bereavement time or they may need an extended illness time. Uh, we really have no idea how this virus is going to impact the teachers who are working currently in our schools or remotely from home. And the last one is just consumable costs. I mean, you have no idea what it means when we start to save paper or soap or paper towels or all of those things that we use every single day in our buildings. And while it might seem like paper towels or soap or white paper are small costs, when you start to you know, pile all of that up over five buildings in central office and hundreds of teachers that could actually amount to a considerable savings. So I've gone a very long way to say we really don't know what the savings will look like. Um, and I think that little by little that that will come clearer and become clearer and clearer to us over time. I don't know if anyone has questions at this point before I continue on. Dr. Kavner, why don't we complete your presentation and then we can ask questions. Okay. All right, so then other questions have been surfacing in the community that we are aware of. So people are wondering, what about prom? What about graduation? I will say that I feel for the kids who are currently juniors and I feel even more for our students who are currently seniors. Um, it's really hard to say at this point uh, what will happen with prom and graduation and I would not feel comfortable being the person to say what will happen with prom and graduation. Those things right there are really questions for our high school administrators and the students who are the leaders in the um, junior class and the senior class. I know Mr. Bishop has already started to have class meetings with those folks and I'm sure that we will find out in coming days what will happen with prom and what will happen with graduation. I mean, first and foremost, I think we have to be attentive to what's happening um, with the pandemic and on a local and global, local, national and global scale. Um, and so I, I think that even if we are unable to have these things, I'm sure that Mr. Bishop will try to look at clever ways to restore as much as we can to students who are experiencing loss right now. Um, MCAS and AP tests, the answers to those questions, they come from very different sources. So the Commissioner of Education, Jeffrey Riley, has the right to petition the federal government and ask to suspend MCAS testing, which he has done. At this point, we're really just waiting for confirmation um, from Commissioner Riley that there will be no MCAS this year. Uh, my guess is that there will be no MCAS this year, but I would not want to speak for the commissioner. AP tests, I believe that the College Board has said that they'd be pushing out tests for students to take in their own homes. That was the last information that I received. I also understand that with AP testing, what uh, the College Board is suggesting is eliminating some of the curricula that would have been taught later in, in the year. So I think that that's where we are with AP testing. And I just want to be clear that any of these things can change at any moment, we really have sort of, I mean, you've, you've witnessed it already, how everything is just constantly in flux. Um, April vacation, at this point, April vacation will go as planned. Spring sports, again, that's not something that falls within the purview of the school department. Um, the MIAA dictates whether or not there will be spring sports. They started with one date of 
um, April 4th and pushed it out to April 27th. And now my guess is it's pushed out to May 4th. So my, my guess is it would be very difficult for us to have a spring sports season. But again, that's not my decision um, or Mr. Bishop's decision to make. Um, and then the last question is, what about advancing to the next grade? What Commissioner Riley has said is that students will in fact advance to the next grade. Uh, we're going to try to push out as much curriculum as we can between now and June 23rd. And I don't think I can say it frequently enough that uh, we certainly will never cover as much curriculum between now and June 23rd as we would if we had students in front of us every day. So that's an important thing for us to, to keep in, our, in mind. Um, what that will mean is that school districts will have to do an assessment. How far did we get with the curriculum? And we will have to kind of gauge when kids come back to school in the fall, where are we? You know, how much do kids know? How much remediation needs to be done in a particular grade level or course before teachers will advance with what would be the typical curriculum at that grade level or in that course? All right, so what else is happening? These are the good news pages. Um, the statement of interest for the Elmwood School has been submitted to the Massachusetts School Building Authority, so the MSBA received that yesterday. And the Student Opportunity Act will still be seeking information from the community, uh, but that planned deadline was originally uh, the 1st of April, and that has been extended by the commissioner as well. Um, and what you see on the right-hand side of this screen this is actually the greatest news that we've had and perhaps I, I should have mentioned this in recognitions but I knew it would be uh, mentioned here. Uh, Mr. Scott, as only Mr. Scott can, has reached out to several of his students and those students who have 3D printers at home uh, coupled with the ones that are at school which Mr. Uh, Scott is now calling the bunker. Um, they are creating face shields like the one you see Mr. Scott wearing and they are going off um, and, and he's been working with the Hopkins Police Department and the Board of Health um, making these sort of available for distribution. Um, interestingly, uh, he, this has become such a popular thing first around the state and now he actually has schools doing this across the nation. But my favorite of all the stories around this is that Cape Cod Hospital reached out to him and asked him if he would be able to produce 60,000 shields. And we did have to laugh about that because if you imagine the production that's going on, it, this is really like a person has two 3D printers on their dining room table right now producing these. So I don't think we can produce 60,000 shields for the Cape Cod Hospital, but we will continue to do this because it's a lovely way, um, I think for our community to sort of help out doing something that's really super productive. So thank you to Mr. Scott and all those kids. Um, and that, that's it, that sort of rounds it out. So I'm not sure if the committee has questions. So questions. Um. I don't have a question, but I, I am getting another uh, comment from the public that we're not, uh, it's gone, the live stream has gone down again. Um, I actually, I got um, something to Nancy that it's going on and off. So I think from our end, if we can continue the meeting and perhaps post this recording, hopefully this is getting recorded well and go with that, right? Mm -hmm. And if not, maybe we will have to reconvene. We'll figure that out. The audio recorder. Yes, we can always use the audio recording as well. Is, um, that, being, is that actually being used right now? I just I think there is a recording has it, we could put the re recorder on just so that we can get minutes accurately if we're not able to broadcast it later. Just so you know, it is on YouTube. I know some folks are trying to get oh, get to it through the HCAM site, but um I found the live stream on YouTube and it seems to be working okay. out. So I've been sending I've gotten a few questions about that too, and I've been sending that link out and it seems to be working. Okay. Great. Um, Dr. Kamna, I have a couple of questions. I think this is great what you have presented. I think it gives a good picture of what you know, what you don't know, what's coming up. I think it, it's very helpful. It covers many, many aspects um, that are impacting our, our school community. Thank you for putting this together and also um, living through all of these unknowns, everyday new information coming and uh, having to decipher all of that. 
Well, thank you. Sometimes I feel almost inept because I know that there are so many questions out there, but right now we don't have all of the answers. And so I am grateful to the community for their patience. Thank you. I have um, two questions um, for you, or maybe three. Uh, the first one, you know, everything is so interconnected, right? Our teachers are parents too, and they are in the same boat as parents in the community, um, and perhaps facing the same challenges. How much of this is being understood at the state level where all these parents are working from home and every home situation is so different? You could have, you know, three children, a uh, couple of them with intense needs and you're still working from home. It's an extremely challenging situation. Um, so how much of it is recognized at the state level when these plans are being put forth in your conversations? Well, I think that that is why the commissioner was originally very reluctant to put out new curriculum to families. And, and I think that that comes as a result of not every family is going to be able to access this curriculum. We have to be very honest with ourselves. You know, we've had some people who have reached out to our principals who will say, I'm a nurse in an emergency room. And so I am not home all day long. And my kids are having difficulty logging in because they're young children to have conversations or um, to, to sit for morning meeting with their third grade or their first grade teachers. And so we really have to be very careful about the ways that we are recording information and making it avail available later in the day. Um, or, you know, asking, you know, first graders and second graders to do work that would normally be um, supported by the teacher in the classroom, paraprofessionals in the classroom, uh, because in, in many homes, those resources do not exist. So I, I thank you for that question, because I'm not sure that all families understand sort of the plight of, of their neighbors. Um, the, the second question I have is for our teachers. What are some of the challenges that they're facing and what additional supports are being provided to them? Do they require training? Do they have home office setups where we are thinking of kids and providing them, you know, with those remote access and whatnot? We have been, uh, you know, our whole education, uh, public education primarily relies on the face-to-face -face interaction in the physical space and overnight we seem to be trying to figure this out, a virtual learning environment. Um, do they have the setups? What training is being done? Um, what's happening on that front? So in terms of training, the training really has been uh, either curriculum specialists who are helping them to you know, sort of get curriculum together that is uh, the kind of stuff that kids can do somewhat independently in their homes. Um, I believe that uh, Mr. Ashok, Mr. Ghosh, and, uh, and all of his team have been super helpful in coming up with new platforms and pushing that out, you know, very slowly, very patiently with teachers. And teachers are in, you know, varying states of tech savviness. I mean, some of them are exceptionally good and really need no support and could start pushing out material tomorrow. But there are other teachers who are you know, people who are accustomed to using, you know, just a couple of programs on their computers and, and that's all that they do every day. Uh, so to actually be able to teach remotely and to be able to collect work remotely and to give feedback remotely, those are, that's a huge stepping stone for a, a lot of our people. And if I can sort of just take the committee and the community into households, you know, if we have a, a teacher, say, who has you know, a, a child who is preschool age, that teacher typically finds daycare for those, those children all during the day, or many of our teachers have school age children, so while the teacher is in school, their children are in school. Right now, there can be teachers who are also moms who have four kids, three kids, two kids, one kid, kids with special needs, you know, and all of that is taking place in a household. So if you are a mom with four children and at 10 o'clock in the morning, something is scheduled for every single one of those kids, there may not be enough devices in that household to put a device in the hand of, of every child. Or if you have a child who has um, special needs and you know, that, that child needs support in the work, there's only so much time that the special educator is available to that child. So now the mom kind of has to take over as a special educator, but also as a teacher of the students in the Hopkinton Public Schools. So there's an awful lot, I think, that's going on um, in teachers' households, and we have to really be sensitive to the fact that there's limited time, limited devices, limited childcare, 
you know, limited support for students with special needs. There's an awful lot going on. So I appreciate your question, Nina, very much. Um, thank you, Dr. Kavanaugh. Um, a couple of other questions come to mind. One, um, you know, you've shared a lot that is happening at the state level, you know, guidance coming from that aspect. And when we look at our state, uh, our neighbors and us, not all of us are in the same kind of a demographic or mm -hmm. needs or what have you. How much room um, is there to do, apply some things locally? Is there any room for that? So uh, I'm gonna apply what things? So anything that you would like, that we would like to do in our district, for instance. Differently from what's happening in other districts? That's right. Um, you know, so DESI is giving their regulations or saying these are some of the things to do, um, but we know our community best. Mm -hmm. uh, is it possible to make those accommodations specific to our community? How much room is there for you to do that? Sure, so I think that we took what I would consider to be kind of a moderate approach. Uh, we took guidance from the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education in the beginning, and now we are going to start putting out new, new curriculum, new instruction, new assessments, all of that. Um, there are still districts across the state that are not going to be doing that. They're gonna you know, kind of keep kids in a place where they are interacting with teachers, but no new instruction. Um, so I, I think that what we need to do is what is right for Hopkinton, and I'm not necessarily sure that we know exactly what that is today. We will know better once we start implementing online instruction. One of the key components to the work that we're doing is sort of an attendance model. So if we have 24 kids in a second grade classroom, for example, that second grade teacher is going to be monitoring who shows up, so to speak. So if, you know, we have all 24 kids are coming um, three days a week, but two days a week we only have 18. At least we have a sense that in that particular classroom, kids are remaining engaged if they can't be engaged every single day of the week. And that's, that's perfectly fine, we think. But our fear is that over time, we're going to have kids that, that we just don't see. And what will that end up looking like? So we're, we're monitoring very closely who is there and who is not there, because if families need food or devices or those kinds of things. We can reach out to folks and, and be able to do that. And I think that that's something that, you know, Hopkinton has always been very good at, right? When somebody needs something in order to be able to first survive and then maybe access curriculum, which I see at this point is very secondary to survival. Um, this is a community that can, I think, engage in that process very nicely. Right. Uh, Nina, Dr. Kavner. Can Sorry. I jump in because I just yes. want to add to what she's saying if, if you're going to move on to a different topic. Is that okay? Yes, absolutely. Um, I think it's really important for us all to realize that some of us are in a greater place of privilege than others. Mm -hmm. And we do have a number of students who if new material is introduced into the curriculum, will not have equal access to that curriculum according to the law. And so there might be some houses which are set up really beautifully to help their children. There might just be one or two kids. Both of them have internet access. Um, none of them may have any special needs or learning differences, but there will be households where that is just not the case. And so what you're doing is you're disenfranchising a portion of the student population if you introduce new curriculum that all students do not have equal access to. I don't hear of any universities trying to, to introduce this at, at such a rate. Um, many universities have now decided to go over to a pass-fail grading method because they're well aware of the inherent material inequities from house to house. And so, you know, I, I'm flabbergasted by all that you've been able to accomplish as an administration in these past 10 days. I mean, wow, steep learning curve and you have hit every mark. But I feel sad that you feel some pressure from the community to all of a sudden ramp up the competitive engine again. And I really want to just say that this is not fair. This is absolutely not fair for those kids who need some help in enabling them to better focus when they're not accustomed to interacting with the screen. And so I just want people to, to really sit for a moment 
and acknowledge the amount of privilege they may have in their own lives that many people do not have. Um, and I'm just sorry that in our district, we're already feeling like we have to press new curriculum and grading implementation and not really thinking about our most vulnerable population. <clears throat> which I think you are, Carol. I absolutely think you are. Mm -hmm. um, but I would just ask everyone to take a deep breath. Yes, and, and you know, thank you for that, Meg, really, because that is a great concern of our administrators and our teachers, those, those students who are, you know, the kids that we are going to have to keep a very close eye on. And, and really, that's that whole nature of the attendance piece. Are we seeing these kids? Are they able to do the work? If not, what's the obstacle? Um, and and it, if if this needs to be slow and steady, it will be slow and steady. And and I think that that's just the nature of education when it's public education. And in the face of a pandemic, we have to think about all of our learners and how to help every child to advance. And and I know you're doing that. And I thank you. I just hope we can help encourage the rest of the community to lead with their hearts, yes. right now, and yes. to lead with the community in mind and not themselves. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Mina. No, that's okay. Uh, I, I think, uh, you know, we understand the concerns that Meg is bringing forth. And I think those have been at the forefront um, all, all the way across. Um, so Dr. Kavnerman, you know, you were talking a little bit about looking at our community and trying to understand what can be done in our community. Um, and I know there's still a lot of work and uh, based on what you have shared, it looks like some of these things and plans that get rolled out will truly happen only after April 7th and that, you know, until then at least it's certainly a clear pause. Mm -hmm. um, during this time, um, is there any thought, you know, I know we typically have uh, uh, school council, right, where there are groups of people who are able to get some input or understand what are some of the things that are going on. And we are hearing all of this through you at the moment. And I know this is a difficult time for everybody. Is there any plan or any thought around uh, involving perhaps some of those bodies uh, in these conversations? Or maybe it's already happening. So just want you to understand that a little better. So at this point, you know, and I've had these conversations, I think over the last couple of weeks with the building principals, we're really just trying to wrap our head around, heads around what the new normal looks like. We don't have that answer. Um, you know, we could get two weeks into teaching new material and realize that this thing is just disastrous, right? We, we don't know. Um, I guess what I would say is that once we are in a place where the curriculum seems to be a little bit more sound and set and this new normal, as much as I, I hate using that terminology, um, actually feels a little more comfortable to all of us, um, then I would think that it would be, you know, appropriate for principals to start doing the things that they would typically do, right? And reach out to groups like, you know, their school councils or if they have to have those kinds of meetings, but we'll be having these meetings remotely, you know? Right, and I guess the reason why I ask is, will parents be part of some of these conversations and trying to understand and lend that voice um, of some of the pain that I'm hearing? One thing that I've certainly heard uh, from parents is um, that some of this is optional, not mandatory. Are you able to comment a little bit and share uh, why that is? Yes, that was part of the first phase. When, when the commissioner had said, uh, that he really didn't want us moving forward with curriculum. He had said that he would like for us to put things out to make sure that kids were still engaged and families felt connected to school. I mean, if, if school is that place where children go for six and a half hours a day, five days a week for you know, 40 weeks out of the year, to be severed from that, it's gonna be pretty disconcerting, I think, for kids and for families. So he wanted that kind of connection. But he also had said to us that when you put that, that that learning out there, and we kept calling them remote learning experiences, um, they have to be pretty much voluntary. So students can either engage or not engage, but you really shouldn't move forward in the curriculum. You know, that, that was the message loudly and clearly from the commissioner. Um, anyway, uh, at this point, that has changed. So he has pretty much said now that districts should do what feels best for that particular district. 
Um, he does want kids engaged in learning, whether learning means that you're going to continue to practice the skills that you've already been taught, whether learning means enrichment kinds of learning, whether learning means project-based learning. Um, but whether you introduce new curriculum or not is entirely up to your individual school district. Mm -hmm. Dr. Kavanaugh, any which way we look at it, this is extremely challenging. It is. Um, and, you know, for, for parents, for teachers, for community members, for everyone involved here, for, for you, for all the administrators. Um, I'm wondering, um, you know, as we move on this path of the new normal, uh, what kind of consistency and communication specifically, uh, you know, can be expected? Is there some plan around just sharing some of this in a periodic manner? I know you have been sending emails with all the information that you have. What can, what can parents expect on that front? So I will continue to put out information, but I think that the best communication to families comes in the form of the classroom teacher. I think kids are thrilled to hear from their classroom teachers. Okay, great. Um, those were my questions. Uh, are there questions from other members? Is anyone on mute and speaking? No? On mute. Now I'm speaking. Okay, um, no, I think most of my questions were covered throughout the presentation, and I do appreciate a lot what Meg said. I mean, I think I, I'm very thankful that the district has focused on well being of our staff and our families in the short term. Um, I'm one who's always pushing excellence in education, and, you know, I'm one of those sort of hardcore about the academics kind of person. But in this particular circumstance, I think um, the greatest impact that I've seen, at least in my you know, small circle, is those points of just connecting with the mm -hmm. teachers, just being able to engage with the class and the teacher, even if the curriculum is not moving forward, just to see each other, just to, just to say, hey, we're still here. And I, I think that comfort of still being part of your own community, especially, well, at really all ages. I mean, the, the older kids, um, that is their life. I mean, their whole life is at school. And I think the younger kids, you know, the same thing. I mean, they spend six hours a day there. So I'm, I'm thankful that if we, at a minimum, can maintain those consistent points of connection and then build from there, I think we just have to all, to Meg's point, breathe and move forward. And I, I'm very confident that if we find ourselves on June 23rd not having met what we think is re the required um, curriculum to advance, I'm very confident that we were going that we'll adjust the curriculum in the fall. Um, maybe I'm speaking out of turn, but you know it seems that it just seems no, no, you know natural to think that way, and I think I'm assuming that's what we will do. Um, so uh, I have a lot of faith in you and the administration. I definitely want to keep in contact and here as things, as plans take shape. Um, but I think starting where we're starting with just being engaged is the right place to start. So thank you for that. Thank you. Maybe any other questions, thoughts? I'll just add in a um, couple thoughts. And I guess I, I probably should have said this during recognition because I really do think the teachers have done an excellent job of reaching out to the kids. I can speak specifically to Hopkins and the middle school. Both of my kids get up in the morning. They know school starts at nine and they go and they check out and they can't wait. They can't wait to see what their teachers have posted. So I'm so grateful for those teachers who have really stepped up at the middle school and in Hopkins. And, you know, I imagine the other schools are the same. And so um, I'm speaking from experience because I am a teacher and we've been spending, you know, probably double our normal workload trying to convert our curriculum into something that can be accessible virtually. And, you know, as all everyone has pointed out, some stuff just can't be accessed, accessed virtually. So I think, um, you know, trying to find creative ways to teach it in a different way or expose children to it in a different way is, is something that the teachers have done a great job in Hopkinton. And I think, you know, the kids, excuse me, who are accessing it, those kids, um, up until now, the percentages, I've been keeping track and the engagement has been somewhere in the approximately a third of the students. Um, so at least that's my experience. I don't know what the experience is in Hopkinton. So, you know, having that sort of optional um, 
I don't want to say uh, limitation, but it, it kind of was a limitation because we know that sometimes kids won't do it because they're not being graded. So I think, um, you know, as we move forward, it, it is a slow process to take curriculum that you'd normally present face to face and convert it to something virtual. So we need patience, you know, as Meg said, we need patience because there is a ton of work going on behind the scenes. I don't know that Dr. Kavanaugh has slept in the last 10 days. I know that folks in the state for sure haven't. And a lot of the teachers are putting in a ton of extra time doing what they can to convert their, their curriculum. So it really is just be patient. It, it will come together. We just need to be calm about it. Well, thank you for that. And, and I should also recognize our teachers, the building principals. I mean, they, it is true that I don't think any of us have slept very well in a very, very long time. We're working really hard. So thanks, Jen. Any other comments before we move on to the next item? So I just wanted to echo what other people have said about the amazing effort that's gone into all of this from our educators, administrators, and everybody but also just wanted to comment on the 3D printing is very cool um, and meaningful <laughs> in the world. So thank you for everything. Hurrah for technology. We are appreciating technology now. I like that. Mm -hmm. um, okay, moving on to the next item on the agenda, SC Chair Report. I have approved warrants on numbers 20-048, number 20-049, number 20-050 and number 20-051. The warrants have been included in your packet. <laughs> Besides that, I have also um, on behalf of the school committee uh, submitted the Elmwood SOI, which Dr. Kavno had detailed uh, through the process. And based on, um, you know, Dr. Kavno had shared that with the entire school committee and based on, uh, the feedback she received and her recommendation, uh, I move forward to approve it electronically. And this application currently um, has details of a two to five elementary school uh, and some other changes. Uh, and Dr. Kavanaugh has also shared that this is a preliminary proposal and is by no means final. And this is something that we will review fully as a community uh, and the focus will be on the replacement of Elmwood School. So I'm hoping, uh, you know, with all these things that are going on, hopefully all of this uh, will move forward and, you know, some of the conversations of CEG will also continue. Uh, besides that, uh, Select Board um, announced at their last meeting that the annual town meeting will be held on June 22nd this year and town elections will be held after that. Uh, both Jen, uh, Devlin, and I, our term um, ends this year, and we were asked if we would continue to serve until um, the town elections, and both of us have confirmed the same. Um, and hopefully we will get to know the date for the town elections at the next select board meeting. Also, um, we received, Dr. Kevin and I received an email regarding the budget discussion that we had from last session. Uh, there was a concern raised that you know, some of the documents that we were referencing related to the budget were not posted or not accessible to the public to follow along. Uh, the documents we reviewed were the comprehensive budget document from budget discussions. It was not a new document from the school perspective. And of course, we had referenced the town hall's budget document from March 12th. Dr. Kavanaugh requested our town manager to share the additional document with the member of public. Also a suggestion was made to have a drive available and accessible to the public where documents created all the way up to the meeting can be added. Uh, I think it's a good suggestion um, and with the committee's consent worth exploring. I don't know whether that's something we wanna take on right now with everything that's going on, um, but I think generally we do have some items, uh, for instance, tonight's report that Dr. Kavanaugh shared in detail if that's something, you know, some of these are being worked on until the last minute, so they can be added later on and made accessible. I think it will help uh, public to follow along. Mm. The next thing that I wanted to share was uh, a, we had received a concern related um, to the transportation policy. We will review that, uh, those questions raised by uh, the member of the public when we review the transportation policy. 
Besides that, Appropriations Committee member um, has raised a question to the Select Board and the School Committee if it makes sense for Appropriations Committee to move forward with the overall FY 2021 budget review, knowing state tax revenues will likely get impacted and with ATM pushed off to June 22nd. Um, and you know, with all that's going on in the schools and also towns work on the public health front, uh, while financial planning and preparedness is important, there's too much going on at this point. Um, what I have requested is that both obviously planning and preparedness on the financial front is important for the FY21. However, having a clear guideline on what that means and a timeline which is reasonable and respectful to the work that's going on, especially on the school front, is what I've requested. I haven't heard back on that front yet. Um, hopefully, there might be an update at the select board meeting uh, next week, um, and I'll bring that update back for everyone. That's what I have for chair report. Liaison reports. If anyone wants to unmute. I have just a quick one um, from Hot Coalition. Actually, it's from Don Alcott, uh, Youth and Family Services. There is a free webinar, which may be um, of interest to people. She wanted me to get the word out, helping teens cope with anxiety during COVID-19. The webinar is on Thursday, April 2nd from 2 to 3 p.m. Um, and you can just register. It's Like I said, it's free. And it's a topic that may be um, very relevant to a lot of families right now. So if anyone is interested, they can either reach out to me or to Don Alcott at Youth and Family Services to get the um, information for registration. Thank you, Amanda. Yeah. Any other liaison reports? Um, I guess uh, both Amanda and I have been working a little bit on the procedure front, and um, there's one item coming up later on in the agenda. But also they've started to look at the budget process a little bit and you know looked at modeling that and just started to brainstorm um, how we have been doing the budget process and what are the possible points we could define procedurally. So hopefully in one of our upcoming meetings, we will bring that back for the committee's review. Um, also, um, I, uh, you know, Jim Cousins has reached out to all of us about a hangout hour that he's doing. Some of us have confirmed that we're able to join. I think it's a great idea to continue to stay engaged in some shape or form. Um, I have um, accepted to join the hangout hour sometime next week. Uh, I think Friday, next Friday is when it's my turn. Hopefully all of you will consider it as well. Uh, I think it's good for the community to continue to see how we're faring. The next item on the agenda is office hours. Uh, we had canceled our office hour from earlier this month. We, were, we had plenty of um, music and um, you know, concerts that we were hoping to have our office hours at, which got canceled. So one thought uh, that Nancy and I discussed was to have a virtual office hours. I know there is a lot going on for each one of us too. We are also in all of this craziness. Um, but I wondered, uh, we were both thinking that it would be a good idea to offer that if parents just want to speak with us. And, you know, now we're not able to see parents day to day, you know, um, in the community easily, where we are all in isolation. So perhaps this is an opportunity to offer that option. I don't know what other members think. I think that would be great, especially considering how truncated my social life is now. <laughs> it would afford me with a good opportunity for socialization. So I'm all for it, Mina. I'm here. I'm not going anywhere. Okay, that's good to know. Yeah, likewise. I think office hours would be a great idea. Okay, so we had talked about possibly, uh, you know, March 31st, which is, you know, four days from now. Um, Maybe we can uh, publicize that a little bit and figure out an hour or two and figure out the mechanism if we should do Zoom or something else and we take turns if we're not, obviously we're not hosting it. So, you know, we could have two members uh, at a time for the hour or so. Um, so we'll take care of that. Nancy, that's on you and me. 
Uh, okay, that sounds yes. great. Sounds good, Nancy? Perfect. All right, thank you. Moving on to the next item on the agenda, new business policy EEAA transportation services. First reading, Dr. Cavanaugh. So I will start this, but the transportation uh, working group is made up of uh, Mrs. Fargiano and um, Mrs. Devlin. So I would invite them to jump into this conversation at any point in time. We are bringing this forward now because this is the point in time when we start preparing for transportation in the fall of 2020. So even though it might seem like, you know, this is coming along at this point in time for a first reading, it's an important time frame only because our transportation department is, is sort of getting up and running for next year. So we did take a look at this policy. The old policy was EEA, and this one has been um, renamed EEAA. Um, and I think that we had done that only because it fit in with the policy lettering for MASC. All right, and so a couple of the things that um, we have looked at in here, uh, we are looking to move to having students have uh, one morning pickup location and one afternoon drop off location. Uh, one of the advantages that we have sort of this time out is that there will be aftercare in Elmwood Marathon and Hopkins next year. So if a student would like to have access to aftercare at Elmwood, for example, um, the student can simply stay there um, or that student could go home on his, you know, or her own afternoon school bus. So I think that that resolves some of the issue. Now, if a parent had a child who was at Hopkins and a child at Elmwood and wanted the Elmwood student to go off to the Hopkins, uh, location that the, your one pickup place in the afternoon would mean that the Elmwood student could get bused to Hopkins and that would be your one location. Um, right now we're making these decisions and they have a so, sort of strong budgetary background and we are doing it because we have students who have seats on multiple buses so if on Monday I ride bus 7 on Tuesday bus 8 and on Wednesday bus 9 while I'm on the Monday bus, bus eight and bus nine are riding around with a seat reserved for me, but I'm not in it. And you know that's starting to cost us some money. And I think that next year we'll be going from 29 buses this year to 31 school buses next year. Um, so we are really just trying to streamline the transportation policy and to some degree um, kind of clear up some of the confusion. At the end of the school day, we have teachers putting students on different buses, different days of the week. And I'll be very honest, we sometimes lose kids. And by lose, I don't mean that we permanently lose them, but they realize that you know halfway through the bus route that it's Tuesday and they shouldn't be on this bus. So they get driven back to school and you know, or the bus driver is sometimes able to you know, drop everybody else off on the bus and then take that student to the appropriate location. So there's this kind of like craziness that goes on um, on those afternoon buses. Um, and I'll let the two of you talk a little bit about some of our decision making as well. Go ahead, Amanda, you can go. Yeah, I'm, I'm good. I mean, I think, I think you covered it well. I think um, with the new, as you said, with the new child care options available at all of our schools, it really helped us to look at a, a change that we thought um, would be better for student safety, for sure, because there are students do, who do occasionally fall through the cracks um, and just better for um, our budget which is obviously constrained this year. And I think, you know, for me personally on the committee, in light of um, just that horrible uh, bus issue with Holy Cross uh, in, down in Florida and, you know, the horrible tragedies that happened there it was just a stark reminder that the bus drivers really are there to drive the bus. And the more that we look to them to, to make sure they, you know, are, are figure out which where every individual kid has to go. It, that's not something that they can do. That's so. I think we want the bus drivers to drive the bus. We want to streamline um, how we use the bus, allow everybody a morning and an afternoon. But you know, the, the simpler we can get, uh, I think, the better for everybody and for the budget and for the students and for the drivers. So that was kind of some of our thinking. Mm -hmm. Yes, and I think um, also as we grow, uh, you know, a couple of years ago, we only had to keep track of, you know, 3,000 students. Now we're keeping track of 4,000 students. Um, so it's as we grow, it becomes a much 
bigger management issue for the administrators. I know that um, Dr. Kavanaugh mentioned that there's a person who basically spends her day ensuring that the buses are, the children are, are getting on the bus that they're supposed to be getting on based on all the changes that happen on any given day. So I think, you know, we need to, we need to streamline this process. And now that there's childcare at all three elementary schools, parents can either choose to have them stay or they can choose um, a bus stop where they want that child to get off. And it doesn't have to be their house. So it's, I think this is a, this is a, a good sort of compromise between what we had had in the past and, um, you know, knowing that parents still want some flexibility, but we need to make sure that we have the safety of the kids first and foremost, and then also that we have sort of the fiduciary responsibility to the town. Our budget is becoming um, bigger and bigger as a result of our growth, so we need to make responsible choices, and, and transportation is one where we can make some pretty responsible choices. Yeah, I'm glad you brought up the issue of the administrative assistance. So at Marathon, Elmwood, and Hopkins, there are people who work in a secretarial capacity who for almost the entire second half of the day are really going through all of the bus changes. And we can have 60 or 70 of them in a building in, in a given day. That feels like an awful lot of change. So, you know, they are really over scrupulous about the job and, and they have to be because we want all of our kids to get on the right buses. But my goodness, from, you know, in all afternoon, they are just, you know, watching bus changes come in and ensuring that teachers know where students should go. Are you able to walk us through some of the procedure documents also and some of the thought process behind that, please? Yes, so you know what, I will um, <clears throat> bring that up right now. We had a, a couple of people who did get in touch with us about this policy. And um, two of the people were, I think, interested in things that I would consider to be procedural. So one of them talked a little bit about the appeals process and we are putting the appeals process out there front and center so people have a very good sense of what that looks like. Um, it does not fall under the purview of the school committee because it's procedural and school committee governs policy, but we certainly want this to be as transparent as possible. We want people to know that um, if you are dissatisfied with your bus stop, um, what is it that you are are supposed to do sort of procedurally to have your voice heard and then the um and, and i think i had reviewed this in the transportation presentation i had made but that appeal goes off to a small committee and the committee has our director of finance and operations the bus dispatcher our transportation coordinator, the superintendent, uh, two or three school resource officers. And so there, there are people who are very invested in, in children in, and in children's safety who sit around that table uh, making the decisions about approval or, not, or denial really of the appeal. Um, and we wanna be very clear with families that if they you know, have already paid their bus fee for the year and they get to a place where they are dissatisfied with the outcome of the appeal, we are happy to work with them on, on a reimbursement of that bus fee. You know, we certainly don't want to have unhappy customers, but we want our, our, our busing to work as, um, as seamlessly as it can and we want our kids to be safe. So um, the appeals process will be you know, certainly more transparent um, or at least put in a very front and center kind of way so parents can see that. Great, thank I you. I, I have to thank um, Dr. Kavanaugh and Ms. Rothermick and, and quite a few folks in the uh, um, district offices because I think Amanda and I, um, we heard from the community about um, some transportation concerns. And even though some of this procedural work doesn't fall in our, under our purview, they, they really were sort of welcoming as we tried to kind of figure out what the heck you know how does how do these things happen and um, how do these processes take place are there ways that we could streamline we kind of stuck our nose where we don't belong kind of thing but we did it because we heard from the community and we wanted to find out if there was anything that we could do to help um you know facilitate change and i think um the folks in the district offices just just picked this up and ran with it the changes to the procedures have been ongoing over the last i don't know three months maybe more than that even um and um, there have been some really good changes just to try to put everything out there so that folks don't have to search around to find what they need. And once those procedures are done, the plan is to link them to this policy. So when you see it 
um, on the website in our um, policy section on the school committee link in the website, you'll be able to just find those those procedures very easily. I think just to, um, I mean, we probably should have started here, but just to kind of define like what goes in a policy, I think when we were discussing really the policy is a statement of what the school committee wants to offer for a service level, a level of service, more or less. It's what, and if you, if you look at the MASC reference policies, you'll see they're very, very, very short. Ours is much longer, but, um, you know, and I encourage people to go, you can Google the MASC um, policy reference manual and people can look at the policy EAA and see what the Mass Association of School Committees is suggesting we use. Um, in Hockington, we actually offer more, believe it or not, for some people, but we offer quite a bit more than is um, minimally required. And so our document is much longer, but it really it is a statement of our school committee level of service of um, transportation to the district. And then how that service is delivered is procedural. And so um, we say, for example, that in Hopkinton, we will provide transportation, I think in the first paragraph, um, regardless of how far away from the school you live. That's actually beyond what the state requires. The state, I think, has a two mile radius. We say, you know, wherever you live, it doesn't matter. Um, K to six, it's free. And wherever you live, you get busing. We're not we're not asking we're not asking people within a two mile radius to walk or pay. So that's that's different. Um, the fact that we offer different buses in the morning and the afternoon for our, our K to five students is unique to Hopkinton. So that's why that features in our policy. We want to offer that. We think that's important. Um, how we we do think it's important that we have a transparent appeals procedure how that actually is implemented and the timing, that's really up to the transportation office and the, um, the district. And a lot of factors go into how changes to the original routes um, are made because they, they're trying to look at all the changes um, in some cases. And, and if there are significant impacts on multiple routes, it's easier to kind of reorganize all those, re-engineer all those together. So, um, there's sort of a, a method to the madness of uh, holding all the appeals and having an appeals meeting um, and how, how that all plays out. And that's very much up to the transportation office. Again, as Jen said, we were very fortunate that we could um, share a lot of what we heard and a lot of the input that we got from the community has gone into the thinking, but um, provided the, process, the procedures are effective, that's, you know, sort of outside of the policy domain. Right. Um, so, you know, actually that's the reason why I was surprised to see that level of detail and that all included in our package, uh, all the procedure documents. So I just wanted to understand what was, you know, going on with all of that. And typically we have the procedures at the bottom, like if there's any cross reference, right? Mm -hmm. But we have some of it embedded here in the policy. Um, so uh, I'm sure you all have been working on this so you understand the consistency of how you want to maintain and manage that. Right. And I appreciate the fact that you have heard and, you know, taken into account some of the things that we heard from the community. Yes, and, and I think that that is why we put the procedure into your packet so that people who were interested in this particular policy could see what the procedure looked like. You know, we, we're certainly not discussing that procedure. It's not on the agenda, but I do think that it appears in the packet for people who are interested. I have um, actually a few questions. One is in the section where it says bus stops. Um, it says school bus stops will be at centralized locations. Mm -hmm. um, I was wondering if we could define that a little further. I know we have talked about safety up front. Uh, I think we had talked a little bit about how winding our roads are, different from some other communities perhaps in certain places. So is it possible to say school bus stops will be at, you know, um, safe centralized locations and if I, there are any parameters around these centralized locations. How, did some thought go into that? I'm sure you, you know, I know how the verbiage goes and you all discuss, I've been through one session. And uh, if you can share some thoughts around that, please. Sure, I would say that 
we, we make sure that all of our bus stops are safe or we have language in, in our, our policy that says um, that it is the responsibility of parents to get students to our bus stops. So if the bus stops themselves would be safe, but if you feel like transportation from your home to that bus stop is something that you're sort of struggling with, you, it's really your responsibility as a parent to get your child from the home to the bus stop. And I know people have struggled a little bit with centralized or what we sometimes call consolidated bus stops. But when we have 31 buses going across 31 square miles or 28 square miles, I think is Hopkinton is, um, across these sort of slow and winding roads, it takes a very long time to be able to pick up and drop off students, especially with multiple runs. And so, you know, we have had to move to consolidated stops. And I know that sometimes it's difficult to par for parents to be able to transport their child to the bus stop if they feel like the walk from their home to the stop is unsafe. Um, but but that is, you know, that's that's kind of the best that we can do, given the fact that we have to get kids to school on time. One other thing, Mina, we did talk a lot about um, how safe is a very subjective um, in a lot of instances and how we define it would really dictate um, quite a bit. And, you know, if we asked every single person in this meeting what, you know, safe is, we would all probably give a slightly different um, response. So the hard part about policy is um, we can't define safe. We need to make sure that it's a place where that, you know, um, that makes sense for a child to wait. Um, but that determination is not made by policy. It's made by procedure. And if a, a, a parent is unhappy with the um, bus stop because their perception of safety is, is com you know, is compromised, that's what the appeals is for. And then we have a room filled with police officers and bus dis dispatchers and, and the superintendent and um, just to make sure that, you know, or to check and see that maybe there is an, an indication that this stop needs to be changed. Or unfortunately, maybe there's just a sort of differing perception of what safety is. And I think that's the, that's a hard, hard thing because we don't want someone to feel unsafe, but we have to transport 4,000 students. So, um, you know, it's a, it's a slippery slope when we start putting in subjective things into policy, I think. And so we opted um, specifically not to define safety in the policy. Okay. Um, you know, again, um, just one voice, just with that one sentence, um, I would feel more comfortable by saying safe, but leaving the safe definition of safety to um, the implementation and through the appeals process challenging. That's how I feel about it, that we don't have to define it. That's something that Dr. Cavanaugh and the whole team that's listed in the procedure of you know, who all is, we know it's not a simple process of coming up with these locations. It's a complex process. Um, so my hope is, you know, what, what is that is something that they define. You know, for instance, I live on a street where, um, you know, the speed limit can be 35, 40 in certain portions of the road. Um, you know, all of that I would imagine is something under the purview of, you know, the procedural part. But from a policy standpoint, I feel comfortable to say that it has to be safe. Um, that's just me one voice there. Um, the other question I had was related to drop off. I, I recall at some point, and I, maybe I missed it on this policy, uh, we used to have a, a age by when, uh, you know, at, at what point you need to have a parent or a guardian present to receive the child. Was, is that part of the policy here? So we don't state that in this policy, I don't think. Um, and you know, Mrs. Rothermick, you're here, so if you want to jump into that, um, you certainly can. But I believe it's our kindergarten kids that have to have a uh, sort of a, a kindergarten in the policy. person. Sorry, Carol. We say um, kindergarten in the policy. Beyond kindergarten, Do we? we don't. Yeah, it's right yeah. underneath. Oh yeah, there we go. Yeah. yeah. A parent or guardian or an adult designated by the parent guardian must be at the bus stop for the drop off of all kindergarten students or the student will be transported back to school. Um, and I just want to throw it out there. I've, I've wondered many times, um, you know, especially if you're talking about centralized bus stops um, and a first grader, 
I, I think it's still young. Um, so just throwing it out there and wondering if there was any conversation and thought process during the policy conversations. So I guess I'll just go back to the under bus stops, the second sentence where it says, it's the responsibility of the parent guardian to ensure safe passage of his or their child over roadways to an established stop. So, you know, we absolutely understand that, you know, at first grade, it might be getting off at, at that bus stop, but it really becomes the parent's responsibility to know that, you know, if we're asking, you know, a first grader who lives 0.4 miles from the stop, we would not want a first grader walking 0.4 miles, or maybe we would want a 0.4, depending upon, you know, the kids that, that that child walks with. Does he walk with, you know, an older sibling? You know, it, it's really hard for us to say, which is really why we have avoided defining what is safe, because some families might let their first grader walk with an older sibling who's in third grade. Some families may never allow that to happen. Some families might live in a cul-de-sac with a sidewalk and think there's nothing wrong with it. Some families might live on you know, a winding road with no sidewalks. So we really are in no position to determine what is safe because what's safe to me would be very different from a parent or you know, somebody else who's on you know, the committee or we just felt like we, we weren't in a position to determine other people's safe. One last question. Um, this is with regard to an email we received about um, administering EpiPens on the school bus. And if you can share a little bit about uh, how does that get covered? How are the you know, um, bus drivers, you, know, you talked about safety, right? We want our bus drivers to be focused on driving, but what do they do in um, emergency of that situation? Um, and what kind of guidelines are available? How is that covered? So under Mass General Law, there should be, should be no one driving a school bus who is not a, trained to administer an EpiPen. But when we say that that person is trained to administer an EpiPen, what we mean is that person in an emergency would be able to do that. Um, I think that, you know, we, we would never want our bus drivers, nor will Connolly bus allow this to happen, to be the person solely responsible to administer an EpiPen. So it's very different to have been, say, for example, I'm first aid trained. Um, and, you know, in an emergency, I might administer first aid to someone. That's sort of the same mindset with the EpiPen. The bus drivers, EpiPen Epi trained in an emergency could administer one if there were one there and the bus driver was, and a, a student was going into anaphylactic shock. But we can't say to that bus driver that it's your job to drive this school bus, maintain discipline, and make sure that that child in seat number three doesn't go into anaphylactic shock because you're also, you're not just the bus driver, you're also the person who's solely responsible to administer an EpiPen. Um, but that is, again, one of those things that really doesn't fall under school committee purview. If you look at um, this section that says students requiring accommodations under IDEA, students who require accommodations under the Individuals with Disabilities Act or 504 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973 are provided transportation in accordance with current statute and regulation and the student's IEP or 504 plan. So what happens is when a student has um, a particular need, uh, what happens is that that's pretty much worked out through the special education department. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kavna. Other questions from um, other members? So I just want to thank you guys. I know a ton of work went into this, and I know that um, when we have brought up transportation policy in the past, it has evoked a lot of emotion uh, and concern from the community. I'm assuming we're not looking to pass this tonight because it's our first reading. Um, Correct. Is that accurate? Yeah. yeah. So the uh, one suggestion I would have is I know probably daycares and after school places are starting to look towards next year. If we could share the, the fact that this policy may be changing so that their families can consider whether or not XYZ after school care makes the most sense for them next year if they're not requiring five days a week. Mm -hmm. just, just so that I know the last time this went through, um, we did have concerns from after school care. And I think one of the issues was that it was perhaps later in the year than this that they had been received notice that we were doing this. 
or considering doing it because we didn't do it last time. Mm -hmm. So because we'll put, bring it back for another reading, we'll send this back out again if that would be appropriate. Yeah, I, th I was surprised that we didn't receive any feedback, but I also think folks are coping with much larger issues than thinking about bus transportation for next year right now. So I, I wonder if, you know, in a couple of weeks, once we've settled in a little bit, if we might receive more feedback and maybe because of the child care at all, all three elementary schools, we may not. So we'll kind of see what happens. Maybe, maybe this will work out. And I just want to also point out that um, Carol's just scrolling through the old policy um, above. And if people are looking at the old, if you wouldn't mind, please, if people were looking at the old policy, which I think called out things like bus switching and we, again, we tried to put just policy in the policy document and procedure in the other documents. And so we are, we've retained bus switching, which is the, um, the freedom for our older students who are in grade six and above to um, get on at bus different from their their home bus in the afternoon. We do have um, students who really enjoy the freedom to be able to do that. And there are some guidelines around that, which are really procedural. We haven't taken that away. We've retained that. We just pulled it out of the policy document and put it in procedure. But it's the same flexibility is still being afforded to the kids in grades six to 12. And, and likewise, if you're kind of comparing the two documents, and you don't see the same wording, it may be that we put it in a procedure document. So um, definitely ask if, you, if you're looking for something and you don't see it, send us an email for sure. But um, also consider that that was one of the, the guiding principles behind our review of the, the policy. I will, I will offer quickly to last year at kindergarten orientation, um, most of the marathon parents are already thought that there was a five day a week policy. Um, so I know there was discussion last year and they had already assumed that it was a five day a week and were more than willing to, you know, accept that they, they thought that was okay. Just so you know. Good. Okay. Good. Thank you, uh, Mr. Othamek, and good evening to you. Uh, I am wondering if there are any other questions or comments. Okay, um, so we will move on to the next item on the agenda, policy EEAEC student conduct on school buses. First reading, Dr. Kavno. Let's stop appeal. Sorry. Are we on EEAAPRC? Uh, nope, we're going to the next policy. Okay, sorry. We had so many procedures here. Oh, okay. there we go, student conduct on buses. Okay, so this one is EEAEC. Um, I think that the only changes we really made to this one is we've added language at, at the start of this. Is that correct? And I think that what we are really trying to stress with student conduct on buses, uh, a couple of things. Number one, the bus drivers sole responsibility is really to operate that school bus without distraction. And we are very concerned when our bus drivers are uh, frequently having to, you know, pull the bus over, deal with, you know, students who are doing things that uh, the bus company would say, if you have a student out of the seat walking around, you have to pull the bus over and um, wait until that child is back in a seat for safety reasons, and then you can continue to drive the school bus. Um, so when we have conduct issues, what we're trying to do is to say to parents, it's, it's really not the school bus driver who needs to um, discipline a child. The, the driver should only drive the bus. So what, what ends up happening is parents are confused about you know, where do they go if there's some kind of discipline problem that their own kid is having on the bus. You absolutely positively need to go to the assistant principal at any one of the buildings because assistant principals are those people who deal with the discipline. So if you hear from an assistant principal that your child's having behavior problems on the bus, that's one thing. If you feel like your child is behaving on the bus but experiencing difficulty with another child, in either of those two cases, the person that you should reach out to is the assistant principal. And I don't know if there are other things that we had thought about with student conduct on buses.
I think that was the main point. I think it was really the last sentence of the first paragraph um, was right, here. Yep. In, right in there. We really wanted to, to make sure it was clear because that was something that we heard. People were unclear what to do with disciplinary concerns or behavior concerns. Mm -hmm. And um, and again, I think there will be, a, if I think on the transportation website, if it's not there already, Susan, um, there, there will be guidelines for how to reach out to your principal, what to do if you have a behavior concern. It's not for the bus driver, it's for the principal or the vice principal or system principal. Yeah, on the um, transportation website, there is a document of FAQs and it's broken out by um, subject area, if you will. And so there is a whole piece of the FAQ that talks about uh, student conduct. So parents certainly could go there um, and hopefully some of the questions they have would already be answered as part of that FAQ. Great. Yeah, and I think as you look at the cross references, you'll see that the high school handbook, middle school handbook, elementary school handbooks are all listed here because they also make reference to um, discipline issues and, and student conducts on our school buses. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Cavanaugh, Amanda, and Jen, um, any questions from committee members on this policy? I see Nancy shaking her head. How about you, Meg? Any questions from you? Okay, I don't see her head any which ways. Uh, it's static. So Sorry, uh, I can unmute myself. No, no questions. Okay, uh, so in any event, we will bring this back. Uh, because this is our first reading and just wanting to give everyone an opportunity to reflect on this a little bit, especially with, um, as Nancy talked about, with, even with the earlier policy, this is a difficult time. We need to give folks the time to react to anything that we are bringing forth here. Okay. Um, also, we've received messages that um, the streaming on YouTube and the TV has not been consistent. So um, hopefully the recording will have gone on well and we will be able to share this uh, immediately through various means. We'll have to circle back with HCAM and seek their support in getting that pushed out to folks so they're able to watch it overall um, because there is certainly anxiety in the community trying to understand all that was shared, especially with COVID-19 updates uh, Dr. Kavanaugh provided. Okay, moving on to the next item on the agenda, FY21 budget discussion, Dr. Kavanaugh. All right, so I don't really have much of a discussion. Last time we were together and we had a nice sort of joint session with the select board, uh, we came away understanding that from the FY21 school budget, we would need to make a reduction of $323,000. And on that evening, we had said that it would be important for us to reach out to the entire administrative team. I'll tell you, the administrative team has met many, many times, but not once has that been about budget discussion. And that has really been because I think as uh, Jen Devlin had beautifully articulated, we are right now in this crazy state of flux where we are just trying to get um, curriculum down pat, get it into the platforms that, that we need to, deciding what those power standards are, um, deciding what it's going to look like when it gets pushed out into you know, a synchronous moment in, in someone's living room. So that's really what we have been concentrating on. Um, and I would hope that in the next couple of weeks, once things kind of settle down and we are living in our new normal, we'll be able to uh, do a little bit more with the FY21 budget. And I think the other piece is that, you know, now that we're in this very strange place, we have no idea how the FY20 budget is going to shake out either. So we have a lot of, a lot of thinking to do, I think, about where we are with the FY21 budget. And I don't know, Mrs. Rothermick, if you wanted to add anything to that. No, I think that, um, you know, that that really sums it up. There's there are so many variables going on with the FY 20 budget right now, just trying to get our arms around that. Um, and the the principals, the CTLs, the SMLs, I mean, everybody has been asked to really look at uh, what is in the FY 20 budget, all at the same time that they're trying to um, push out this whole change of curriculum and instruction. So it, even doing that for this year's budget is going to take some time um, before they can even circle back and, and think about next year. 
Thank you, Mr. Alkamek. Any questions, comments from members? Okay. Uh, moving on to the next item on the agenda, the Tech Collaborative Agreement. Dr. Kavanaugh. All right, so this is very brief as well. You know that we are members of the Tech Collaborative, and it's a phenomenal collaborative to belong to. Um, the uh, superintendent of the director of the Tech Collaborative is Liz McGonigal. And several months ago, oh, it could be over a year ago now, the town of Medway, Medway Public Schools asked to, to join the Tech Collaborative. And so there's a, a pretty lengthy process that you have to go through. And the Tech Board of Directors has decided that we would like to have Medway become part of the Collaborative. Uh, in that process, what has happened is, you know, you resubmit the agreement and that kind of goes through the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. And so there have been revisions to the Tech Collaborative Agreement. Um, the Board of Directors have, have voted on that, but your school, this school committee would also need to vote on that. And so I am looking for you to approve the revisions of the Tech Collaborative Agreement. Thank you, Dr. Kavanaugh. I am, you know, I'm a big fan of tech. Uh, and I think Medway made the right decision. Too. Uh, so uh, that's great. Uh, are there any questions from members on this? I understand that we need to take this vote tonight in order to be able to submit it back to tech. Is that right, Dr. Kavanaugh? Uh, yes, um, Liz McGonagall said she would need this back by uh, April 30th. So while we are all here tonight, we should take that vote if you're prepared to. Oh, absolutely. Uh, I, I feel prepared. Is there someone um, ready to make a motion? Yeah, I'll make a motion to approve the revisions. A second. Meg and a second by Nancy. We'll do a roll call vote. Um, Meg? Aye. Nancy? Aye. Amanda? Aye. Jen? Yes. And I'm a yes as well. And so that carries forward unanimously. Thank you, Dr. Kavno. And by the way, I'm going by the order in which you are all appearing on my screen. I don't know how <laughs> everyone else is appearing to <laughs> others. Um, like the, <laughs> <laughs> uh, the next item on the agenda, lunch heroes donation, Dr. Kavanaugh. Yes, so I'm really just looking for the committee to accept a very generous gift. Um, you know that we have been putting out all kinds of information about getting kids and families fed during the uh, school closure. So we have a lot of students who would typically get free or reduced lunch in our public schools. Um, that particular account was actually op operating at a deficit. And so the Hop Town Legacy Volunteers on behalf of Legacy Farms North and South uh, sort of put out their own collection. And I'm very, very grateful to them. They have presented us with $2,054.26 that will go to um, students who need free and reduced lunch. Um, both sort of in the past and currently as we move through the, you know, COVID-19 coronavirus shutdown. Well, this is, this is excellent. Is. I know they had uh, pulled together this group not too long ago, Deepika Aruri and a bunch of folks. And I know Heather Smith was also trying to help them out. So this is fabulous. Uh, so many thanks to the group for having done this. I'm looking for a motion to accept. Um, unless there are some other questions, comments from others. I'm just very generous and I, I am thankful for all of the people who are stepping forward through this and, and many other efforts in town as well. So Absolutely. Thank you. Very well said, Nancy. So many people being so generous around town, right? Um, so looking for a motion to accept the $2,054.26 um, for lunch heroes donation. I move to accept the donation. Moved by Meg. Second. Second by Nancy. We'll do a roll call vote. Meg? Aye. Nancy? Yes. Jen? Yes. Amanda? Aye. And I'm a yes as well. And so that carries unanimously as well. Thank you, Dr. Kavno. Moving on to old business, school committee procedure for evaluation. Ms. Fagiano. Okay, so I will click stop share and you can take over. And I can start share, okay. I think so. Yeeks. Hang on. Um, okay, 
Do you see anything? Yes, we can yep. see that. <laughs> okay, so just um, to quickly take you back to where we were um, a few meetings, several meetings ago, one of our next steps following our discussion of the superintendent review indicators, which we did, um, was for the procedure working group, which is Mina and myself, to um, try to draft a procedure for the formative and summative superintendent evaluations. And um, this work happens every year, whether we have a documented procedure or not, as you know. So in, in a way, I think this is um, somewhat um, academic, but, um, but it is important because um, while there are guidelines from MASC, every um, school district has decisions to make about what they do and how they do the reviews and how they go from say individual thoughts to a composite feedback and so forth. So it's important to, um, when you're not in the throes of doing the work, to actually I think step back and see how ideally this process should run. So that when we get to April and May, um, doing the summative review, we all know what we need to do. Dr. Kavanaugh knows what we're doing and hopefully we do it well. So that was sort of the spirit behind this. And um, again, it's procedural. So each year the school committee um, with its new members can change this and review this. So this is just a place for our five people to start. So um, I can you now see the draft? Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. so we drafted a procedure and uh, you know really 90% of this was lifted directly from MASC. They have a um, very detailed sort of guideline for how to approach these reviews. Um, while it is detailed, again, there are areas where they um, use vague language and leave the, the details up to the school committee and the district. So um, throughout this draft document, we've put in yellow areas where we think this are, the five of us need to come back and have conversation. So I'll quickly kind of go through the whole document and then we can come back to the yellow areas, um, which I pulled out in a separate uh, questions to, to chat about document. Does that make sense? Okay, so for the time being, uh, again, I've called it BBA-PRC1. Um, BBA uh, is a, pr a policy that we don't actually have in our manual. Um, that's sort of a conversation for another day, but that policy is a policy that just basically outlines the legal job of the school committee. So we may be as a policy group bringing that forward for consideration. If we don't end up adding BBA to our policy manual, we will give this procedure another name. So. Don't be distracted by that. So basically, um, I'm actually gonna start at the end, which is really probably not what you normally do, but this uh, diagram at the end that I appended is the MASC graphic that depicts their high level five-step process for a, a superintendent evaluation. It begins and ends with a self-assessment. It goes into, um, sort of goal setting and um, analysis, and then the implementation of a plan, and the formative, and the summative. So that is their high level view, which we used for reference. So I'll take you back to the top. Um, so we have um, taken that, adjusted it just a little bit. Um, Nina put this very nice graphic together, and we put some general um, a time timeline associated uh, with each step as well. Um, but basically, as you all know, the school committee at two points throughout the year or throughout a cycle reviews the superintendent. Um, right here uh, in number four, the formative evaluation, which is an informal midpoint check-in, and at the very end, the summative evaluation, which is a formal uh, public um, opportunity for the school committee as a whole to present an evaluation of the superintendent. Always on camera, always fun. So we have added into the five-step process this extra step. Um, as we were going through detailing what it would mean to do the superintendent evaluation, we found that there was quite a bit of meat um, in preparing for the composite review. And we are obviously five individuals, 
and we have our own experiences throughout the year with the superintendent and the work that is done and our own way of um, thinking about that. And we all take a stab at our individual evaluations and the process that we as a committee use to go from our individual input to the final composite review um, is what we would put in this preparation phase. That's actually kind of where the meat of, of the work I think is for us. So just to quickly go through each step at a high level, um, around June or July, as really already happens, the superintendent would do a self-assessment of how the last year went um, and how the year has gone um, with, based on goals, um, the uh, focus indicators or target indicators from the rubric um, and every indicator in the rubric because the superintendent is responsible for all of them on some level. Um, for each step in this, uh, we put inputs and outputs. So the inputs into the self-assessment would be, among probably others, the district strategic plan, um, any metrics that we are looking to improve as a district, the school improvement plans, and any feedback that came out of the formative evaluation. The outputs would be the superintendent's own self-assessment and um, identified areas for goal setting. And this is really internal for the superintendent. We don't really see this. There's no hard output exactly. Um, but the self-assessment is important to feed into the next step. The second step is the analysis, goal setting, and plan establishment. Um, the inputs to this are the self-assessment. Again, the district strategic plan, MASC is very uh, firm in um, wanting our evaluation and our goals to tie to a plan. Um, so they, they, they always reference back to the district strategic plan and we should do the same. Uh, the school improvement plans and again, any other metrics. The outputs of this would be the, the roughly five or so SMART goals um, that Dr. Kavanaugh identifies usually at the end of the summer. We have this happening in August. And um, at that point going forward, we as a committee should agree on the target indicators for the superintendent evaluation. This year we did that in I think like February or March for the first time, but going forward we should um, at the beginning of the cycle set those indicators. We would then move into the implementation. Mostly implementing the plan is doing the work of the district and most of that happens outside of the realm of the school committee. Um, the, again, the, the input for the work of the, the year, the goals, the indicators and the strategic plan, we wanna take action on all of those things. The outputs um, during the year would be the updates that we get from Dr. Kavanaugh on um, goals. We, we get those regularly. Uh, in this document, we suggested that maybe monthly at the first meeting of the month would be a target. Um, and then throughout the cycle, if a goal is completed during the year, that might be a time, that's why it's highlighted here, that would be a time for us to get sort of the full readout of that goal and any metrics rather than wait till the end of the year. Um, just get that, that full report whenever the goal is completed in real time. Um, Let's see, going from the implementation of the plan, we then move to the formative evaluation in January. Um, this is not a written evaluation. Um, the inputs are the goals, the indicators, the metrics, um, and any monthly update reports that we've received. The output would be the superintendent's self-assessment and the school committee's verbal feedback on the goals and the standards. Hold on. Um, and the feedback may include a blend of strengths, competencies, and opportunities. And um, we had identified, uh, Nina and I in discussion, that at this point also the superintendent may identify or ask for assistance with obstacles. I mean, there is also an opportunity in the middle of the year to say, you know, I was heading down the path for a certain goal and I've hit these obstacles. I need additional funding for training or I need, you know, whatever it is that the school committee can maybe help with to remove obstacles it is perfectly legitimate to um, have those requests. And then the summative evaluation would happen between sort of April and May. Again, you see a lot of yellow in this section, and we'll come back to this, but um, we prepare it uh, in April. And I think, um, as we've done in the past, we're assuming that we would all take our time to sit back and look at the rubric. Um, I can actually click to that if you want. I'll just quickly show you that. Um, so this, 
Oops, sorry, that's not the rubric. I'll click off of this. Anyway, there is a rubric, which is not linked here, um, which has all the indicators. We would all evaluate this, the superintendent on our own, um, and we would feed those individual evaluations to the chair, um, and then we would, Mean and I are suggesting that uh, we would hold a school committee meeting um, dedicated to resolving discrepancies and preparing our composite review because it is important to remember, as is stated uh, by MASC, that the school, the superintendent is reviewed by only one evaluator, and that is the school committee. It is not the individuals. So um, we are suggesting that we have a separate meeting uh, where a school committee gets together and, and goes through any any about any ratings on any indicators that we disagree on, any um, comments or um, you know observations that we want included in the write-up, um, all of that can be worked out in a dedicated meeting before we actually present the final evaluation to the superintendent. And then our suggestion was that we do the superintendent evaluation in May. Um, it would the input is the summative review and um, you know, the output would be maybe suggestions for the coming year. And um, so there are two, there are several things to talk about. I will go to the questions in a second, but um, we had written in that the Hopkinton superintendent evaluations will be done by the school committee members who are, who serve during the last fiscal year in the evaluation period. So um, we want to make sure that if you were on the school committee this year, you are doing the evaluation. We don't want a, a newly elected member who hasn't had the experience of the, the fiscal year to come in and do a review. So that brings us to the yellow areas, which I kind of summarized here in the questions. Um, so the first question was, what time period do we want to use? Um, the MASC document suggests that for um, established superintendents, uh, three years or more in their position, you can move to a two-year review if you want. Um, Nina and I discussed this a little. We felt like a one-year review was the most appropriate, um, but that's something that we as a committee should decide. So I'll stop there for a second. Any thoughts? So this is only when someone um, has been the superintendent in the district for three or more years. They Correct. Said this over two years. Um, and like Amanda said, we felt that a yearly review is more appropriate and not a two year review that's too long a period, even for an experienced um, superintendent. So just wanted your thoughts on that. Um, so in the past, it, they've always done every two years. We've done our we've done every year. Um, well, after the first term, the first three years, they've done every two years. I don't think so. I think they're they're pushing very hard to align the reviews with the goals, and I think they're trying to allow for the fact that there might be longer range goals that might span two years. It might take two years to actually meet the objective. Yeah. Um, so I. I took it, I think, I think this is a bit of a shift actually, that they're suggesting that a longer timetable is possible. They're not saying what to do, they're just saying it is possible to do this. If we went to a two year review, the formative would be at the end of year one and the summative at the end of year two. Okay. So previously, uh, we did not do annually after we had a superintendent who had been in um, in the position for more than three years, uh, but I also know the MASC guidelines in the way that this has all been done has shifted. So, and that's why last year felt kind of new for everybody, regardless of how long we've been on the committee, because we hadn't done it. I don't think anybody that was on the committee last year had done it a full review like that previously. Okay. That is correct, Nancy. Um, you know, again, uh, it might be okay to just go forward with doing this every year. And maybe next year as a committee, you know, everyone can just revisit it and say, 
do we want to switch to a two year um, or not? And I'm also curious to hear Dr. Kavno's thoughts on it. So I guess I would just say, you know, I think that when, when we made the transition to this new evaluation process, that's what they did with teachers, that's what they did with principals. So I think that this was just kind of uniform across, you know, every single kind of layer in the hierarchy of public education. So a principal, for example, would um, be evaluated every year for the first three years, and then the principal would go on in every other year plan. So a formative after the first year and a summative, summative after the second year. I think, you know, over time, um, I guess it gets a little bit different for a superintendent because I think sometimes you have goals that are two-year goals that 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 fit well. Um, but you know, really, it is up to sort of the will of the community to the uh, the will of the committee. And I think you know, it's just a matter of th that compilation of a summative evaluation at the end of the year feels like a lot of work. Maybe after four years, five years, seven years, ten years, however long a superintendent's been in place, you kind of have a sense of that person's work. So, you know, I don't think that it really matters whether you're doing it every year or every other year. Either way, the superintendent's doing the work. Yeah. Or should be doing the work. Yeah, I, mean, I, can leave it. I, I think, um, you know, as Dr. Kavanaugh said, we teachers are on a two year cycle. They produce. Um, you know, we, we got into this last year, they produce evidence at the end of the first year to show that they're on track. Um, and that's part of their formative, ass uh, formative assessment. And I think, you know, if you have an experienced superintendent who you've given positive reviews for for the previous three years, having sort of that long term two year vision is potentially a good thing. I think that if you um, are still receiving um, feedback on the goals and on the um, indicators in a in a sort of work in progress kind of form as opposed to a this is all over and we're going to start again next year kind of form it, it's a little bit different but I think it gives good insight into what the superintendent is doing I'm look I keep looking because I've got two screens going on here um, I think you know I'd support a two-year review for an experienced superintendent um, but I also think they're essentially the same thing it's just a little less i guess it, i guess it's probably a little less work for the school committee because we wouldn't have to go through and file a form a summative assessment every year um so yeah, i guess it depends on the committee's comfort level with the person they have in that position and for the purposes of documenting our procedure i mean again we don't have to actually lay every little detail out, but I mean, we can leave this language that I highlighted. So it sounds like everyone's comfortable with the possibility of a one year or a two year. Mm -hmm. So if we leave the language as it's written, which is just that there is a possibility, it sounds like the committee is generally okay with that. And we can decide, um, we could even put a sentence in that says something to the effect of um, during the goal setting, we agree on um, you know, the evaluation term cycle length or something. I mean. Um, I don't. I don't think we have to nail it down beyond this. As long as everyone is comfortable with the possibility of the two-year, that then we can just leave it as it's written. Okay. Um, so that was easy. Uh, so the second, the implementation of the plan. Um, um, the the key things here were um, as the goal as a goal is completed. I think we tend to hear about that during the um, superintendent report. I think what we're just saying is if, if it's an official report out of a completed goal, um, we should make it a separate agenda item on a school committee meeting and then just kind of put it to bed. Hear about it when it's done, get, get the full report out on that goal, um, be able to ask any questions on the metrics or whatever um, evidence we were using to evaluate that goal and then kind of have that done, but have it done as a separate agenda item. Does anyone disagree with that? Okay. Um, on the formative evaluation, um, is everybody comfortable with it being a verbal, a verbal evaluation? I am. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Um, do we feel comfortable if people want to give individual written feedback that they do that at their 
on their own if or do we um, want to make sure that we all follow the same procedure? So, so, so I wrote that I, I would suggest that if um, if a school committee member wanted to give um, some feedback, I think that it would have to become in the form of a prepared statement that they um, read at a regular meeting. Okay. Um, I think that that way it would just kind of keep things out there, but it would be public. Um, but I also, I, I don't think it should be off the cop. So I don't think it should be something that people show up and say, yeah, you did a good job with the budget this year. You know, I think it needs to be, you know, however many sentences, succinct, prepared. And then if, if you want to give that evaluation, come ready to give it kind of thing. Okay. Okay. So do you, we, I may add, um, we'll bring, we can bring this back for a final review, but I may add just a sentence in this output section that school committee members wishing to give more, more official feedback should create, should draft, or should present it as a, um, whatever you said, Jen. <laughs> yes, as a written statement. Right, and I think, I mean, you know, if they don't want to write it, fine, if they have notes, but I, I do think it needs to be something that's prepared, and it's not just an off-the-cuff in that particular meeting, here's your chance to give feedback. I think it's, yeah. you take a look at what's been offered to you, you formulate your thoughts, and you have them written succinctly to offer. So um, if there's anything that you're concerned with or anything that you think has been particularly awesome, you're able to call out both those things. I agree with that. Yeah, I think also just having it as a separate agenda item will help with that. Yeah. Any other thoughts? Carol, do you have any thoughts on the formative? Are you okay with that? I'm okay with that. I think that I agree with what Jen said, that there should be a consistency about it so that if there's sort of an agreement that it's a verbal thing, even if there's something written that it is read aloud yeah. at the time of the, the formative. I agree. Okay, uh, the summative evaluation. Um, so how do we feel about, about having a preparation step? Like, so last year uh, when we did the, the summative evaluation, we individually wrote our feedback shared it with the chair who made the composite, which we then discussed at the same time as we delivered it to the superintendent. So um, I don't, I mean, again, we were kind of learning um, and I think it, it worked, but we were thinking that in the event that school committee members disagree or have um, more discussion they want, you know, to enable us to reach consensus as input to the, to the one, um, composite review, a separate meeting to look at uh, the summative before it's actually delivered, a creation of a composite um, meeting would be a good idea. How do people feel about that? I agree. I think that makes good sense. It took forever last year, so it'd be nice to have it broken down into two steps. And I think it felt too like we were talking to each other and we weren't actually talking to Dr. Kavanaugh, whose review it was, <laughs> who sat there and watched us have our conversation with each other. Um, and it, it felt like it should have really been maybe two steps, two different steps. The, uh, I, I just want to say something there, Amanda. I think to Nancy's earlier point, we learn. Last year when we sat through it, we were all new to it, that process. And, um, you know, Nancy led us through that and we were all learning through the process and we have learned some things and now we're making this proposal, which hopefully will work. If not, then next year there's another opportunity to revise the process a little bit. But I think we are definitely more experienced than last year. A absolutely. And I think it's also, to some degree, it's our district's sort of our personal choice. There are certainly many districts who do that work at the same time as they deliver. There are many, many ways to get at this. So this is our opportunity to kind of say, what do we think will work for us? Um, and we are lucky that we have last year, as a, the same five people had last year under our belt that we kind of all can process and move forward on. 
Um, I think that will add to a greatly improved process, though, having it broken out into two meetings like that. You think? I mean, you were on the receiving end. Do you think it would have been nice to have a chance to talk? It, I think it would have been a thousand times better for us to have had that opportunity to talk it out first before trying to put the whole thing into one piece. But it's like Mina said, we you know we have the value of having been through that experience, all five of us together, and to be able to look forward to what's a better process for next time. Yeah. Okay. Um, so one thing that a little sort of a footnote comment in the MASC guidelines was a suggestion that in order for something to be included in the composite review, it be highlighted by at least two members. Um, so I, I guess I'm asking, I think I put, um, let me just go back. Um, I'm not sure if I put that in here. Did I put that in here? I'm not sure, but it, which one? Ex uh, Amanda? It was a suggestion that in order for something, there's always the yes, question yes, it was of, there, how, of what to include. Yeah, yeah. So having at least two people have a similar take in order for that to that be a large yellow paragraph that's highlighted. It, is it in here? Your cursor is almost on it. Uh, yes, there we go. On the last sentence, yes. Uh, when creating the draft composite evaluation, the chair will include comments or ratings that reflect the majority and are cited by a minimum of two members. How do we feel about that? I like that. I think it goes back to the point earlier that it's the evaluation is done by the committee but it's still my you know recollection of this is that all of the individual comments do go to dr cavanaugh i think they're all public record right right yeah. can i ask a question amanda mm. as, as part of that summative evaluation preparation do we try to solicit comments from the public to help us I mean, do, do we seek any kind of public commentary before we write our evaluations or, or put our thoughts together? Because I know we all have a, a unique view here of what's going on, but um, I'm always eager to kind of tap into what the larger public is thinking too. I don't have an answer for that. That's hard and fast, but I think yeah. as we each think about um, the, the goals and the rubrics and the evidence and the, the um, explanation of the different levels of evaluation at, for each um, indicator and so forth. I think we have to decide what body of knowledge or facts we base our evaluation on. And I think whether that's, you know, I don't know, I think we probably will each kind of do that slightly in our own way. Yeah, I just wondered because, you know, a lot of those questions are about community contact and communication and stuff, which we might have a, a less broad view of yeah. um, in some ways. It's just thinking out loud, getting more feedback from the public. Yeah. Yeah, I guess I would say in regard to that, that where that kind of lives is under standard three. Okay. You know, there's that whole family and community engagement piece. Right, right. That, that will open a very interesting uh, things up. I think we need to be mindful of how we seek this information. Um, that's just my view uh, when we go to public. Uh, I think at some point I had suggested, although Amanda and I, we didn't discuss that in detail at all, was about a 360 degree review where, you know, you can come up with a list of, say, peers and uh, reports and clients that we agree with, with the superintendent and say, okay, this seems like a pool of people, say five to 10 people, from whom their input um, is helpful into the process uh, versus just opening it up to the public. I would not be uh, open to just opening it up to 
public in general. But I think if we have some agreed upon, for instance, this past year, Dr. Kavanaugh had worked on um, the calendar subcommittee. And if we decide that some members of the calendar subcommittee, say uh, Allison, um, Sokol, or Einstein, uh, you know, just taking the name of a member on that group, who Dr. Kavanaugh had worked with closely was part of that. If we want to take some input from that member to say, okay, what do you think, uh, you know, worked well? Uh, is, do you have any recommendations, you know, on what could be better? I think that kind of a very selected one is what I, I would think would be fair um, um, in terms of evaluation rather than just opening it up fully. I mean, they all hear things, right? We, we do throughout the year um, are absorbing a lot of things. But I think from an evaluation standpoint, you need to be mindful of who those evaluators are. We need to make sure that uh, pros and cons and a thoughtful way, way in has happened. And Dr. Kavanaugh also has an input on who these people are from whom we are taking them. But, um, you know, I speak of this coming from having experienced a 360-degree review and offering myself up for a 360-degree review in a different organization without having uh, that requirement. So um, that's my take, although it does give a very good um, exposure and kind of, uh, you know, again, I feel like many times these evaluations, going into these evaluations, they tend to be so tense, at least, uh, because it's so public in nature. Um, uh, it's very hard, I think, to give, or I'm sure it's harder to receive uh, any kind of, you know, just going through that whole process, right? And right. Dr. Kavanaugh produces so much evidence around it. Um, so again, um, I think the process should be somewhat controlled. Yeah, I guess to, just to comment on something that you just said, Mina, you said, you know, reaching out to people who had interacted with me and who that evaluator is. But just to be clear, the, the only real evaluators are the five of you. Yeah, as you were talking, that was something I, I, yeah. I mean, I, right. that's the job of the elected members of the school committee to do. I think that um, it is public. And when it's posted in the, on the agenda that the superintendent will be evaluated and we welcome public feedback, I think that that's the opportunity for folks to say um, anything that they want to say via email or come to the meeting. Um, but I think that we need, you know, it sort of falls on us to collect the information and right. make the evaluation. Um, so I will, I understand it's the verbiage that seemed like a problem. I did not. Uh, what I was speaking about is not evaluation, but seeking input into the process. Um, now, having said that, uh, Jen, to your point, I don't know if we explicitly ask people for um, you know, public comment or what have you, um, but anyway, this is just we're thinking on the fly here, something that Meg mentioned. Um, Amanda and I did not talk about this. Um, in terms of um, the process, we can all think about it a little bit. We don't do, have to make a decision here. I don't know, Amanda, what your thoughts are. Well, I do think that by, by breaking out the preparation into a meeting um, so that there is a dedicated time that the school committee meets to prepare the composite review, I think that allows for the public comment to be solicited before we're actually delivering the composite review. So, Jen, to your point, I mean, I think we, by giving that extra meeting where this is the topic where we're going to work on um, our composite review, I think it would it would make it easier for people to, to weigh in in public comment if they wanted to. I also think that in most cases, um, Dr. Kavanaugh has done and will probably continue to do smart goals with identified you know, um, metrics. And we sort of have a handshake on a lot of things at the beginning of the year about what we're focused on and what we're going to look at for evidence in, in many of, at least in the goals. Um, so 
I think the evidence is either there or it's not there for some things. And I think Dr. Cavanaugh does a pretty good job of finding that evidence and sharing it with us. And when it's missing, I think we need to ask for it. I think um, we are the ones who are doing the, who are responsible for this work and we have to ask for the evidence that we need. We can ask at the formative review if we're not seeing what we need. That's a good time to check in mid-cycle. Mid, mid um, but yeah, I, I kind of agree, Nina, with your thoughts on that. I would want to open this. It, it's not, the whole community is not all contributing. It's hard enough for the five of us to come up with a composite review. And I think, you know, we have the, the perspective required and the responsibility as elected officials to do this work. So. Okay. I do. Maybe Amanda, uh, we can think about this in the next iteration as some of this is getting cleaned up and bring it back. Yeah, definitely. I did want to um, ask about the timing of the, the summit of evaluation. We had suggested the first meeting in May, which would put it before the election. It's a little bit, if it's a little early, it's not quite the end of the year yet. So it does cut the cycle a little bit short. Um, we had suggested that the last meeting in April uh, is when we would do our, our work to get the composite ready. And then the first meeting in May, does that seem reasonable as a target? Uh, Dr. Kevin, how do you feel about that? I'm fine with that timeline. Yeah. I think it makes sense. So is there anything else, uh, you know, at all about the general procedure that, you know, we should have thought about and we didn't or that you want to add or that you don't like? I mean, we'll definitely come back and review this again, but um, not in this great detail, but now that we've walked through it, we can all kind of go sit with it for another couple of weeks and come back at our next meeting and agree on it. But in the meantime, is there anything you want us to take as an action item aside from um, this comment about other inputs? No, I think, I think it looks very, I guess it looks like what I would anticipate it would look like. It should, because it came largely from, from MASC, again, yeah. with just a few areas where I wanted to make, me and I wanted to make sure that we were in line with the recommendations of MASC. Mm -hmm. Thank you for doing all this work. This is great. And hopefully it's going to streamline the process for not just us, but for future committees. It's a lot of work. Good job. Yeah. OK. Great. All right. So I'll, I'm going to unshare. All right. Yeah, sounds good. Um, on that front, I also just want to quickly touch base about the fact that while we're talking about the procedure and, you know, the timelines and whatnot, maybe something to think about is for the, this year, especially in light of COVID-19 and all that's going on, um, the timelines that apply for this year uh, may be worth um, thinking about for Dr. Kavanaugh and, you know, as to when all of this can be done. So if you can think about that, Dr. Kavanaugh, and let us know. Sure. Um, next time what you think is reasonable and fair. Yes. Um, you know, and we've been talking about that even with teacher evaluation, administrator evaluation, um, just because a lot of the work that we would be doing now at this time of year around evaluation, people just aren't available for it. But, um, you know, I think relative to my goals and the indicators that we had chosen, I think I'm probably able to present information to you that's pretty complete. Great. Thank you. Um, the next item on the agenda, Student Opportunity Act, Dr. Kavanaugh. Yes, and I know that I had said uh, in my superintendent's report that the, superintendent, the Student Opportunity Act um, is uh, delayed. So when we get more information from the commissioner, I will certainly bring um, that forward and we can take a look at it. But for now, I think we can just sort of put that on hold a little bit until we get the actual information from the commissioner. We don't even have a date by which it is due yet. He just said that it would be, that he's petitioning to, to push that out. Great. Thank you, Dr. Kavno. Yeah. Um, the next, uh, um, unless someone has any questions on that. Did I just receive? No. Um, okay, uh, moving on to the next item on the agenda, future agenda items. 
I would hope we continue to get some updates uh, on COVID-19. I think that's going to continue to happen. But besides that, I think you're good. Moving on to the next item, public comments. Anything, Nancy, that you may have received? You're on mute, Nancy. Sorry, I have not uh, received any additional comments. OK, thank you. Um, one thing that I have continuously heard um, through text and email is the quality of the recording. And I think it's crucial, especially now that we're doing um, this public meeting virtually, that we make sure that um, it's transmitted appropriately and folks are able to participate. So I guess we will continue to learn and improve. Um, I'm very thankful for HCAM for having participated through all of this and sometimes those snags happen so hopefully that'll get resolved for next time and um, we uh, appreciate the patience of public on all the questions that they have. Hopefully the recording would work. If not, um, you know, if you're not able to see that recording through HCAM, please feel free to send your questions to the school committee, HPS school committee at Hopkinton K-12 .ma.us and we will answer your questions. Moving on to the next item on the agenda, items by consensus, Dr. Kavanaugh. Okay, um, so as superintendent, I recommend that the school committee approve the items by consensus as outlined in your agenda. We're looking for a motion. So moved. Motion by Nancy. Second. Second by Jen. We'll do a roll call vote. Meg. Aye. Nancy. Yes. Amanda? Aye. Jen? Yes. I am aye as well, and so that carries. Thank you, Dr. Kavanaugh. It's time for adjournment, looking for a motion. <laughs> I, I move that we adjourn. I have to <laughs> oh, That's hilarious. Thank you, Professor Tyler. A motion by Professor Tyler in her wonderful costume to adjourn. Uh, looking for a second. I'll second. I'll second. Not looking nearly as cute. <laughs> it's a good hat, isn't it? It is. Well, motion by Meg, a second by Jen. We'll do a roll call vote again. Jen? Yes. Uh, Meg? I distracted you, didn't I? I. <laughs> <laughs> Nancy? Yes. Amanda? I. And I as well. And so we are adjourned. Our next meeting will be on April 9th at 7 p.m. Um, it is very likely that it will be a virtual meeting. We are expecting to have an executive session as well as a regular meeting. In the meantime, uh, stay safe, be well, reach out and seek support, offer support, and do some disc dancing. <laughs> have a wonderful <laughs> night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night. Bye. Good night. Thank you. Thank you.